Okay, awesome. Um, thanks you guys so much for coming. My name is Holly Holden. I'm the community manager here at Atlassian. We're really excited to have you here at the Devon Tech Talks. It's an awesome opportunity to hear some thought leaders and software just come to talk about anything that they want to and anything that you guys want to hear about. So quick housekeeping stuff real fast. The bathrooms are straight back to the left. The beers are in any of the fridges. And there's wine over here. There's food back there. Help yourself to whatever you need. Um, yeah, so I am going to go ahead and just jump right into introducing Bjorn. This is Bjorn from the best city here from New Relic to present on the platform Holy Grail. So we've got some more. The platform is for you guys and how much we're going to be doing in Hollywood. And I'm sure it's beautiful and it's going to be nice. And lastly, and we're really excited to have you here at the Tech Talks. It's an awesome opportunity to talk about it. So we want to. There's, there's quite a bit of reverb, but hopefully it won't come into a squeal. Um, I, I just wanted to say that uh, I've never presented in front of a better looking and more intelligent audience in my life. So thanks for showing up. <laughs> um, as, as Holly said, I'm from New Relic. Um, New Relic, if, if you don't know about us, we do a, a web and mobile application performance management system. Uh, it has a bunch of good technology behind the scenes. We do code injection into your application right on the web or on a mobile device, or both of them. Monitor the performance. We collect terabytes of data, data millions of metrics a second. Um, show you charts and graphs and pretty pictures. Um, perhaps, uh, perhaps you've seen our ads or one of our have one of our 75,000 T-shirts that we've given away. Um, and but I'm, I'm actually not here to talk about New Relic, even though New Relic has a platform now. Um, so you can even extend New Relic itself as a platform. But in fact, I, I'm, I'm not here to talk about New Relic. I'm, I'm here to talk about the Holy Grail. And to talk about the Holy Grail, I thought I'd tell you a little story. Um, but I'd start by saying, you know, I, I consider myself a software psychologist. And a, a software psychologist is someone who basically puts the code on the couch listens to it, talk about its pain, and then goes and solves its problem in one way or another. Usually we try to do some sort of talk therapy with the code. Occasionally you have to inject some drugs to get it to behave properly. Um, prior to being the Vice President of Engineering here at New Relic, um, I was uh, the Director of Committer Community at the Clips Foundation, which as you know is a, is a famous platform. And I worked for Amazon, OTI, and a variety of other companies in the past. And I'll be using examples from some of these companies that I've worked for in, in, in this talk um, just to sort of explain what I'm trying to do. So as a software psychologist, I'm, I'm sitting around, and this developer comes up and, and starts talking to me. But the, the problem with this picture of the developer is it's a, it's a white male developer, which is a pretty typical um, developer. So we could say he's something a little more diverse, like some of the graduates from Hackbright. But even there, you know, we're, we're, we're going to be picking on any particular person. So I decided to choose the most generic example of a, of a developer besides what you can see, and that's this one. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with Clippy. So Clippy comes into my office and starts talking to me and says, Clippy loves writing code. Um, Clippy does open source code. Um, perhaps you didn't know that when you were using Word and Clippy was popping up. But there's busy committee to get up, making comments on Stack Overflow, having a fabulous cloud explorer. And Clippy is a very happy paper clip. And so, you know, Clippy didn't really need psychotherapy at that point. Um, a little bit later, Clippy discovered money. Clippy discovered that if he was willing to sit in a queue and do what someone told him to, people would pay him money, which, you know, in San Francisco with the high rents is some of the valuable commodity you have. And so um, you know, Clippy became even happier. And so Clippy went from working entirely for himself to working for somebody else. And then Clippy was looking around, that's the thing with his smartphone, and discovered the App Store. The App Store has this fabulous characteristic, which is that you don't have to be working for people to pay you money. In fact, once you put your app in the App Store, people give you money, okay, 99 cents at a time, but they give you money all day long, 24 hours a day. So, 
it, it's even better than working for yourself on an hourly basis. You can now build this out. So of course, Clippy really really happy. But you know, then Clippy discovers looking around that there are a bunch of companies that get paid when other people write applications for their for their platforms. And you know, there's Facebook, there's Lastly, the you know, Hudson, Second Life, Minecraft, these sales floors, a bunch of companies, and Clippy says, that's what I want. That's the holy grail. Not only do I get paid when somebody else writes applications, I get paid, get paid when somebody else uses my application, I get paid when somebody else writes applications. It's perfect. Um, and it's even better because when I build an application, I have to figure out what my customers actually want. But when I build a platform, that's somebody else's problem. That's those people who build the application problem. I don't have to do that. And it's more fun to build abstractions. So Clippy decides to build a platform. But then it occurs to Clippy that it might not be quite that easy. Because if it were that easy, everybody would have built a platform. And they'd be out there, there'd be lots of successful platforms. So that is when Clippy comes into my office for some counseling. So Clippy sits down on the couch. Says, I got a problem, Doc. I want to build a platform, but I don't know what a platform is. He said, well, let me help you with that. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what a platform is. Well, you know, a platform is something that you can extend, and you don't have to ask permission of the original authors to do so. It's one of those things where if you're a programmer, you can add new functionality to the original platform with something that the original author may or may not even have thought of. Um, you can put in, um, you know, by the time you can make inclination, you can build new solutions, craft solutions that the original authors didn't think of or hadn't even imagined. Um, this particular quote comes from Mark and recent, and you'll see in my talk a couple times when I put little Bentley links down there where you can go to that particular link and, and see the original article that this case uh, Mark and recent wrote. Um, and if you don't have time to type it in here, they'll be on the online version of the talk. You can actually click through. Um, so that's what a platform is, and there are three different types of platforms. Um, the first type of platform referred to as an access API platform. And Google Maps is a good example of that. That's where there's, it's a platform and you can call APIs on it and get something back. You can get the results in your own application. And you know, except that you can't actually fundamentally change the way that platform works. You can use it, but you can't change it. But, and so you know your the platform provides data and UI is actually but the second level, plug-in APIs, where you can actually make some changes in the original platform. For instance, in Facebook, you can post on people's timelines and walls and so on. But your code still runs outside of the platform itself. And then the third level of platform is the runtime environment. And Salesforce is an example of this, where if you're running a Salesforce plugin, you're actually running inside a virtual machine that Salesforce hosts. Now they're very clever about the way they do that, so you can't write code that doesn't steal other customers' data, but they're fundamentally hosting your code and executing it. It's executing actually in strap is running inside their platform. Um, so that's all good. Clicking listens for a bit. And uh, you know, I said, okay. And so, you know, like a good psychotherapist, I say, tell me about your mother. Except in this case, I don't really care about his mother. So I say, tell me about your users. And so you know, I have a list here of seven different things that, that um, platforms need to have. And so we start with, tell me about your users. And so one of the things that platforms need to be successful is a lot of users. They, the reason you need a lot of users is that attracts the people to your platform to do the extensions. Nobody really wants to write for a platform that doesn't have any users. So for instance, if you were writing, say, Toolkit or maybe an editor or something for Erlang programmers. All four Erlang programmers would be ecstatic, but you don't have a really big audience there. Um, you know, and so it's the network effect of having lots and lots of users that makes a platform powerful. Um, so you want to make sure there's enough users. You want to make sure that those users are interesting users, um, and you want to make sure that they're doing cool, uh, cool things in general. Um, and just to be clear, the platform users are not necessarily developers. Right? These are people who actually use the platform. There's also another set of people which is the developers. And um, the developers are the people who actually either extend your platform by building plugins, or they um, develop the original platform itself. But those are both developers. And 
you know, for those of you who don't know what this picture is, this is the picture that if you go through the door there is the rest of the Atlassian office filled with fabulous developers who develop interesting platforms like Jira. Um, so there I am talking to Clippy. Clippy finishes telling about his users. And um, so I said, do you ever feel so put me in your life, do you ever feel overwhelmed? Do you ever feel discouraged? You know, is, is life ever too difficult or random? Um, you know, to pop up for unknown reasons. Um, and in fact, he says yes. But um, so, you know, in, in platform sense, what that means is you have to make it easy for people to contribute to your platform. It, it's not good enough to just sort of build something. You actually have to make it easy. Um, this, this is just a random picture I found when I was Googling around for build systems. I have no idea how anybody can build a build system that's complicated. Um, but the, the, the key message I want to get across here is if you want to make it easy for people to participate in contributing to the platform, you have to make it easy to build, you have to include all the build files and scripts and so on. One of the things that the Eclipse project did when I was, when I was working at the foundation is they actually made things this mistake, is that they didn't make it easy to compile Eclipse from scratch. You could download a copy, and Eclipse is a great IDP, and I still use it. But if you wanted to build it from scratch, the only way to do that was to work at it in itself. And so it made it difficult for people to contribute back to the exact core because they didn't supply all those kind of files. Um, another thing you want to do to make it easy to contribute is you want to make the legal agreements easy. Um, pretty much everybody has a platform has some sort of contributor legal agreement that says, you know, basically you, you agree not to commit viruses to our plugins and expect them to our users and things like that. And um, a lot of platforms, including the Red X here on the side, um, Canonical, tell you to take the, the, um, the agreement, print it out, sign it, and fax it back to them using a couple of technologies that I didn't know still existed in the printers and fax machines, right? Modern companies, like say Puppet Labs, allow you to do this directly on here. Puppet Labs allows you to authenticate and sign a document with your GitHub credentials. Um, Ops code does a similar thing with an Adobe electronic signature. But they just make it easier to contribute. Um, you also want to make sure that to make it easy to contribute, to leave a bunch of room for people to contribute. You want to make sure when you're building a platform that you don't build everything possible and therefore make it make it difficult for people to find narrow places or big places to insert into. So um, you, you want to you want to say provide great solutions to selected problems rather than say average solutions to all possible problems. Because if you provide great solutions to selected problems, you're leaving room for other people to find to supply great solutions to the other problems, or even some new thing that, that you haven't thought of. So, um, you know, some examples of this are uh, uh, TextMate is, is an editor I used that in the previous version had a great solution. It was a great text editor. It did one thing, but then it left room for people to have lots of plugins that support the various programming languages. Um, so don't try to get everything to everyone. And then when you're doing that, when you're leaving the room uh, for people to contribute, you also want to go that extra mile and make it possible through APIs to do contributions that perhaps you hadn't imagined. Um, you know, not just the obvious APIs that your platform would imagine, but, but other things that, that you're not currently using but other people might be able to use down the road. Let me give you an example of that. When I worked for Amazon, um, one of the things I built was a comparison grid like this. This isn't actually the Amazon one. They since discontinued it because apparently it wasn't, wasn't that good sales tool. Um, but the idea was, and mine was for VCRs, again, an obsolete technology. Um, but you had VCRs across the top, and then in, inside there was a database, and so the content people could go and say, well, and this VCR has four heads, and this VCR has two heads, and so on, and it would generate this table automatically. And so that worked. But because I didn't completely figure out all the things that users wanted. I said, well, I'll just I'll add an extra ability for people to put HTML blobs in instead of data things. So that then, you know, if they wanted to do something I hadn't thought of, they could extend my, my table for that email. And I came back a few months later to find out how the content people were using. I discovered they didn't use any of the database stuff. They all used the HTML blobs because they got a much better user experience out of that. So it's one of those cases where I hadn't even anticipated that that would be the result. If I added this extra little I've like gone the extra mile and made it possible for extensions that I hadn't anticipated and it ended up with a better user experience for all of, all of my users. Um, 
So another thing that you need to do for making it easy to contribute is you need to have graduated levels of participation. Often a platform project will say, we love coders. You know, if you're a developer, come here and contribute and put in lots of effort and so on. And if you're not a developer, you can write documentation. And that's typically what the platform you know, says. You can, you can be a coder, it'd be awesome, so you can write documentation. And you know, that's sort of a lousy way to attract people to contribute because there might be people who are somewhere in between there, but they don't maybe have the time to write all that code, but they don't want to just write documentation, they want to find some other way to contribute. So to make a really powerful platform, what you need is a graduated level of contribution, many different places inside that platform that people can contribute. Um, you know, ranging from writing documentation, writing small pieces of code, reviewing other people's pieces of code, you know, just a variety of things all the way up to contributing to the portal platform itself. Um, so remember that, you know, you, you don't want to set the bar for contribution so high that basically nobody will be able to contribute. And again, if it's write a bunch of code, write documentation, you're setting the bar really, really high. Now, I know that all of you here in this room are instantly above that right code bar, but there are many other people out there who might want to contribute. Um, and again, this is one of the, the things that the Eclipse group did wrong while he was there, is that you know, for good reasons, they set the bar to contribute to the core Eclipse project very, very high. They wanted to make sure they had the, the best people working on that project. But it was so high that the only way you could qualify was if you were paid full time by some company to work on Eclipse projects. And there were very few companies that would do that, and so the bar was so high that basically they got very few contributors to do that. So don't, don't set that bar so high. Um, so back to Clippy. So Clippy's making good progress in psychotherapy. He knows about users and developers, and he's no longer confused and popping up at random times. Um, and he comes back, and so then, well, what we need to do is Clippy, we need to talk about your childhood. We need to find about what makes you tick. What makes you the clippy that you are? So we took it back to the beginning. And at the beginning of the platform is the underlying technology that you use to build that platform. Since we're talking software platform. Um, the, the, this set of almost four seemingly random pictures I've got that sort of are, is there to remind me to talk about four things. One is you want to use abstraction, so there's a nice abstract piece of art. You want to use a lot of abstraction when you're building those APIs and build it non as non-specifically as possible. Um, you want to have loose coupling as well as much as possible so that people can replace portions of the platform with their own thing and not have to deal with lots and lots of, of type of coupled systems. You, you want to use the simplest technology you can possibly get away with. Um, I, I think that you know SOAP was actually a KGB invention to undermine the productivity of the US. Fortunately, REST came along to rescue us from that. And so, you know, REST is the sort of technology you want to use. And JSON, rather than some sort of primary protocol. Again, because people can use and edit and, and read JSON, and, and binary protocols just make it easy. So, you know, the easiest, best way to kill off a platform is to make it hard for people to contribute to that and hard for people to use it. Um, so, the second best way to kill off a platform is to make it hard for the users to consume the content. And so one of the things you need to do is you need to make it really easy to take that platform technology and use it. So you know, the Apple and Apple the iOS has a, an app store, which makes it really easy to download, install, update applications. Um, even you know, good Linux extensions have a nice way that you can even write on a t-shirt, where you just download, configure, make, install, and, you, and you've got your extension. So you know, in spite of the fact that those are complicated pieces of code, there's a really simple way to do that. I mean, an RPM, you know, um, package manager, you use npm package manager, you can code or something. But you got to think about that download, install, update mechanism, to make it really easy for people to consume the technology. Additionally, you know, when we're looking at Clippy and we're looking into his soul, what makes Clippy? There's a bunch of APIs down there, and if you're building a platform, you don't want just average APIs. You want platform quality APIs. And, and the difference between an average API and a platform quality API is a platform API lasts forever. I mean, it, it really lasts a long time. I remember you know, when I was going to college, which admittedly was a while ago, there were giant computers that looked like this in the basement of the computing center that they were still running the university's payroll on. And you know, they've been around for a long time. Um, so 
you want to make sure that you're building an API that's going to last, um, that's going to have binary compatibility as you go forward, that's going to have um, compatible evolution so you can have existing clients continue to run. I mean, Microsoft, for all the things that they may have done wrong over time, has made compatibility a, a number one point. You can still take a DOS, probably two for them, I know at least a DOS two for them, and run it on all the versions of Windows that, that are existing today. It's that kind of compatibility which makes that platform a really long, long way of execution. Um, when you're building an API, you, you want to do a few things um, uh, to, to make it great. One of the things to realize is that building an API is, is something you can't just do in an afternoon. You can't just go to a weekend hackathon, build a platform API, and be done with it. It requires a lot of iteration and persistence to look for those cases and, and work on them. And one of the things that makes that work is by having at least two probably three different clients, that's my three different clients, using your APIs um, while you're building. If you are using the API that you are building, the problem is that you know how it works inside. And so you can gloss over the lawyers and you can get around the shortcuts. But if you have three clients that say you, you, and you, using my API while I'm trying to build it, each of you will think in different ways and you will force me to be clear and concise about that API and to cover all the corner pieces. So you really can't build a big platform API if you don't have a couple clients that aren't you using it while you're developing it. Um, another thing to, to remember is um, you know, if your users, say you have a, a bunch of utility classes or functions that you're wrapping my API in, I'm doing something wrong. Because if it's too complicated to use and yes, use utility classes, then I need to redesign the API. Um, when, when, you're building a, when you're building an API, you need to make sure that you have uh, lots of good documentation. Again, you know, it's, it's not enough to just have that API and throw it out there and actually explain how it works. The documentation uh, for a good API reads a lot like a book. Um, so it's not you can't build an effective platform API documentation by having a group of people each write a little bit of it. Because it's not going to be consistent. You have to, well, you, you could have a bunch of people do that, but you have to have one person who owns it and reads the whole thing through over and over again, trying to find out where the inconsistencies are, keeping the whole picture in their head the whole time. Um, you need to have a bunch of automated tests that test the API to make sure that it works. So like a, a bit of green and red test, and every time you make a change to the code, run the consistency checks of all the API features so that you're guaranteeing that exactly what the spec says is executed. Um, you don't want to have unclear, inadequate, or vague specifications um, so that you end up with documentation like this, where it says, and then a miracle occurs. Right? That's not a particularly good scheme for API. I mean, one of the things that you want to avoid in your API is leaving gaps in the specification. I mean, I, I remember when I was fooling around with microprocessors when, when, when I was younger and I was building my own computers, we would take these processors and they had undocumented instructions in them. And the way that the processor was decoding the instructions was, was with the big FPGA in there. And so the undocumented instructions, if you actually executed them, did something. And so people could do interesting things with the undocumented instructions that weren't in this in just the instruction spec. And then, of course, when the next grab of the processor came out and they decided to add an instruction, all of a sudden your program just stopped working. And that was fine if it was just sort of a hobbyist, you know, like, oh, now my program stopped working. But if commercial products started relying on those undocumented instructions, then effectively they became part of the spec of the processor, and the processor manufacturers had to put those undocumented instructions actually in the next version of the processor. So you want to be careful when you're doing that never to Leave yourself open to that sort of undocumented instruction possibility in your API. Um, so um, the, the, the last, you know, the last two things I want to say about APIs are one of them is you have to make sure that you treat all your developers identically when you're talking about the API. One of the really strong things that the Eclipse project did early on is that it treated all the developers, both the internal Eclipse developers and the external people who are writing plugins, exactly the same. Nobody got a special API. Everybody had to use exactly the same API. One of the ways they enforced this was, in fact, Eclipse was written by um, a group of people who were in many different development offices around the world. And so each development office worked on one module of Eclipse, and they could only call the APIs to the other ones. They could never even reach into the other pieces of code. 
Um, so what they ended up with was an API that anybody could use to write a similar ID like the Eclipse ID because they had actually used that API to write that Eclipse ID. Um, Visual Studio at the time took the opposite approach, which was if you were inside Microsoft, you got all the private APIs, and if you are outside, you got this special limited API that you could use that would allow you to do a few things with Visual Studio, you know, like change the color of the font or something if there was an error. But that was pretty much it. You couldn't, you couldn't duplicate Visual Studio using the APIs because those were all the secret private ones. And so as a result, they didn't have a lively plugin um, mechanism, a plugin community as um, resulted in that. Now, subsequently, the Visual Studio team has hired a bunch of the Eclipse people and they've put in a much better API thing and the, the latest versions of Visual Studio are, are very good with their APIs. Um, and then the last thing I want to say on APIs is that it's really important to um, be very reliable when you're building an API. Because remember, if someone is adopting your platform, they are incorporating you and all of your coding practices and all of your quality practices into their workflow. So here's here's Clippy, and this is his platform, and the red arc is, is going to be what users are using. And so they're now relying on Clippy and all of his behavior and, and quality practices and so on. And so if you want people to adopt your platform, you have to be sort of high, higher above the bar than everybody else and work extremely hard to communicate to people what's going on. And, just be really high quality here. Um, it's it's almost like your quality has to be higher than normal software. Um, okay, I've talked a lot about APIs. Um, I, I, the reason I talk a lot about APIs is I'm a software person. I love APIs. I build APIs. But these same principles about being really high quality and reliable and documenting and, and reaching out and so on apply to the other things with the platform as well as the APIs. Um, so anyway, well, let's go back to the rest of the story. So we've got, we've got Clippy. Clippy's still on the couch. Um, he's doing well in psychotherapy, so I decided to bring out the next tool of, of software psychology, which is hypnosis. So I, you know, I, I, I wave in front of him a pencil, because we need a paper book, and I, I ask him about his friendships and how he's doing and how they make him feel. And well, the, the reason I'm asking about friendships is that in order to be a successful platform, you have to have a functional social structure around that platform. It's not enough to just have a bunch of code. You actually have to have a, a social structure. And by social structure, I mean you have to communicate with your users. You have to listen to your users and developers. Um, so the, the developers are capable of, of helping you make your platform much better by, by participating in that. But only if you listen to them, only if you communicate with them. And you have to communicate with them, not just in the short term, but in the medium term, in the long term. You have to be in a roadmap to where you're going. You have to have that reliability that I talked about before. You just have to reach out a lot more. Um, you, in addition, you have to make it clear to the users of the platform who's supporting what. Um, you know, if you pull out your iPhone and, uh, and Angry Birds crashes, you, you generally don't call Apple and complain about that. Well, okay, maybe some people do that. But none of us in the room would call Apple and complain about it. We call Rokio and complain about Angry Birds crashing. But, for instance, the, the Eclipse project made the opposite mistake. They, they released a whole package which looked like an entire thing. And so anytime anybody would install a plugin in Eclipse and it would cause things to go bad, they would call the core Eclipse team up and say, hey, Eclipse is broken. And so they failed to make the social structure distinction between the contributions and the core. And so they ended up logging a lot of triage and sending them to other places. Whereas if you set up that social structure early, you can get the users to, to talk to the contributors when it's a contributor problem and a core when it's a core problem. Um, you, you also want to make sure that you've got a community and that you're attracting high quality third party developers to that platform. Because remember, you built a platform because you don't want to do it all yourself. You want other people to contribute. And so you, know, you want to balance the quality of those developers and, the, and contributions with the quantity of them. You don't want too few, but you don't want them to be low quality. You know, so you have, there, there's a lot of balance in building that community. And in fact, you can't just build a better mousetrap. You actually have to convince people to come and, and join the community. Um, so one of the things you, you want to avoid doing is you know, this, this little French over here. If you if you argue French says, I participate, uh, you participate. Uh, he participates, we participate, they participate, someone else profits. So you don't want that model. You want to set up some model where 
um, if I participate, I get some value back. You have to decide when you're building the community what that value is. It might be fame. Um, Microsoft uh, actually did a really good job of this with their MVP program back in the, the 90s, where they took people who spent a lot of time in their communities talking to help their users and helping them out, and they gave them special status. And they invited them to Redmond once a, once a year to talk to, I don't know, to Bill Gates, I mean, just a bunch of uh, famous people. And, and that fame was enough that there was a lot of community involvement there. Or you might provide some value in, in terms of you know, the ability to charge for things or something. So you know, take good care of your third party um, developers. In fact, many successful community or, uh, platforms have a community development program that looks a lot like a sales fund. They actually go out and raise awareness of what it means to be. They recruit people. They carefully funnel them through so that they're developing community members on the fly. And of, of the communities I know, the one that does the best job of this is the Drupal community. If you've ever been to a Drupal con, well, if you've ever been to a, a tech conference, you know, the first thing that happens is the keynote and some famous person, maybe the CEO, gets up on stage and starts telling you how wonderful they are and how wonderful the company is. If you go to DrupalCon, the first thing that happens is Dries gets up. He's the head of Drupal, the inventor. And he gets up on stage and he plays a video of all of the contributions that people have made over the last year and puts their face up there and thanks each one of them for their contribution. That's the very first thing the conference has. And they always have a photo of the whole conference and he's out there recruiting people to run the different parts of the Drupal project and so on. He's very conscious about making that community function. It's really a, a fabulous thing. But the point is, they're basically treating it like a sales fund. And they're not just saying, we put out a better mousetrap, things are going to happen, but they're actually recruiting that community. So, you know, the, the hour is up, Luke is on the, Luke is on the couch, he's feeling better, and he realizes that he still might want to be a platform, but it's a lot more work to be a platform than he thought. It's not really the holy grail, it's, you know, it's awesome to be a platform. But then you have to satisfy a much larger set of people than if you're doing just an application. And you have to satisfy, you have to build a stronger API, and you have to build a community and all these things. And, you know, Clippy, Clippy says, wow, that's really a challenge. And I said, well, we can talk about that next hour for another $450. And at that point, Clippy realizes that there are many more ways to make money with software than just applications and cloud forms. So, Thank you very much. I'll take some questions. Questions? We want to build a robust community. We want people to be able to fail in private. They fail often when they're developing, so when they push something up, it's a high quality. So, what do you think should be provided in terms of? Say local simulators or development sandboxes or public testing places. What's that effective approach? Well, so you know, there, there are so many different ways that you can provide the possibility of um, you know people doing their failing in private so that they don't fail in public. And you know, I I hesitate to recommend any one specific thing. I think it depends a lot on how you do it. For instance, in in Eclipse, where Eclipse runs entirely on your computer. Um, you, you can fail entirely locally because you can run it all there. Um, in, in a system where, say, like, if you're writing a Facebook application, you, you actually run it in a sandbox. And so when I was writing my Facebook applications, I had a separate fake application that I could deploy to first, and I would try it out and fail there before I would deploy the same code to my real application so that you know I had that set up. And Facebook has that set up, and AWS has a similar setup. That with their stuff. So I, I would say it depends a lot on what your platform looks like. You know, and, and like I said, New Relic has a platform now, and we have plugins that you can contribute, and you can have a, a private plugin so you can try it out entirely before you make it public, and so you can make those failures private so that you can not embarrass them public. I, I'm not sure if that answered your question because I'm being a bit vague because it depends on the type of platform, but um, there are a number of solutions that are Yeah, I'll just repeat the question, so go ahead. All right, so question, uh, best practice, experience, uh, tips on uh, creating new versions of APIs and how to uh, uh, apply test coverage to find out, okay, well, we built version one, which is two versions ago, one version three now. Yeah, so the, the best practice is for creating versions of APIs. What, there, there, there's a whole entire talk 
in, in that particular thing because there's so many side issues that you have to deal with when, when doing that. I mean, one of the problems with building a platform is that it's it's that API is around forever. When, once you release that API, it's, it's just going to be used for a long, long time. Whereas if you're developing, you know, entirely internally an application, you know, and I decide to change my API, an API, then you know, my colleague who's using it comes rumbling down the hall and says, "What'd you do?" And I say, "Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. You know, and we negotiated and fixed that." But once it, once you release the platform API, it's out there forever. So you want to have an extensive test suite that tests the API that you've got as if the user was using it against the spec that you've written. And that you know, one of the slides I had was showing exactly how to do that. So that then when someone, when you add to the API, you want to make sure that that same set of tests pass. Now, when you add to the API, you can do it a number of different ways depending on the technology that you're using. For instance, if you're writing a platform that's in say C++, um, you just extend the API by adding more mtable entries to the end of the class, and then all the old API calls still work, but the new ones use mtable entries in the point at class. If you're doing it in Java, it doesn't quite work because the, the JVM uh, will assert that the class has changed and it has a different signature. So you, you either create a new set of classes for API version two, which is what Microsoft did with a lot of their, you know. Um, uh, objects and, and com objects and so on, or you know, just insist that everybody recompile with the new interface definition so that all the, the pointers go the right way. Um, but you know, the, the the trick I think is to try and build in early on what that is. Like the the new relic APIs that we reveal to the world are done through JSON calls, and so not only does the REST version, the, the REST URL have the API version in it, but the data structures of the return. Or JSON, you know, hashes, and so we can add additional fields in there without breaking any original people, unless you know somebody foolishly consumed it, knowing that it had exactly six fields in it or something. You know, then you have one. That does seem really, really exciting. Too. Thank you. Um, so one of the things that you said that really struck me, and I think it's really interesting, is creating roles inside of um, platforms and platform communities that don't directly involve um, engineering or documenting. So I don't know if you're familiar at all with the Cocoa Bots community at Red Eye West Club. So currently there, there appears to be roughly two clubs, you know, building it and, and building a box for it or documenting it. And so I was, I was wondering what the other roles that you would recommend building out around a community like that in order to get people who aren't doing those two things engaged. Well, so I, I would say I'm a perfect example of another role. There's, there's an outreach role. Um, you can have people go around and give talks about that particular community and, and convince other developers to join, even if they're not a developer themselves. Um, you can have people who, who sort of manage the projects inside a community. So, you know, any substantial platform effort has large ongoing things that require someone to pay attention to. And some developers like doing that, and some, sometimes the, the, the projects are complex and I, they need somebody else to do that. And there are people who really enjoy that, that type of work. And so that's a contribution they can make without writing code. So I'll just say there's a lot of things that you can imagine having people do to contribute to that. And if you reward them in a graduated skill, you'll find that they show up and do those things. But if you just give them, there's only two rewards, you know, you're an awesome developer or, you know, you're not, then you'll find out the only people who show up are developers. So you talked about socializing uh, where the where the code was coming from, basically plugging in versus core architecture. Do you have any good anecdotes or examples of ways that you make very clear where that's coming from, so that the support goes to that area? Uh, particularly with like web plugins, for example, and say Facebook or something like that. Um, no, I would say I don't. Um, so so far, the, the the platforms that I know about either were very clearly um, had a division between those two things, or um, they were very much together. I mean, like Eclipse, we really had that problem that people would call up and say, Eclipse is broken. And you have to ask them how many plugins to get installed. It starts to tell you, you sort of roll your eyes, you know, all that one's really bad. Um, so, you know, we, we try and Eclipse a number of ways to alert people when, when we catch an exception. We pop up something like, you know, it looks like that happened in this plugin. 
But we never really found a good solution to that because it was one solid integrated piece of code to the user. Whereas if you look at something like Facebook, you know, typically what you see is Facebook applications and they look a little different than, than the Facebook itself. And, you know, now, again, I can't really say that all Facebook users know the distinction between them, but I would say that many more of them do than in the same thing. Um, so I, I don't really have a good answer. Um, I just um, can you share uh, the decision that you recommended for you to design the platform? Actually, share a decision I regretted in design the platform. Wow. Um, well, a, a classic error that I have made in the past, but of course don't make any more, is forgetting to put the version number in the API. Um, because then when you pull out version two, you really have a problem with this totally distinguished. Um, uh, a, a better case uh, of a decision I've regretted is um, building an API that's very specific for a particular customer. Um, and in the case I'm thinking about, we, you know, we have a good API and then this customer couldn't really do what they needed to do with the, what we supplied in that time of the general solution. So we had an extra API function for that one customer and solved their problem. But we were then stuck supporting it forever. And of course, it had these weird little semantics, which was the reason we built it. And so then we had to support those weird little semantics for years afterwards. And so, um, yeah, that, that was something I definitely regret. Uh, so, uh, New Relic really is a monitoring when it's not be available for Atlassian products. That may not be relevant, but it's the <laughs> reason I do. Um, so, so talk to me afterwards. I, I, I'd love to talk more about New Relic. I mean, I, I, I love working at New Relic. I love the technology. Of, you know, I, I wrote the, the first PHP agent before I became post-technical manager. Uh, so I, I love talking about the technology, but I'd love like, to talk afterwards. Yeah, thank, thank you very much for coming. Oh, one no more question. Can you expand on how we dealt with support for Kanye's and not to cause confusion to customers in the US one stop shop? So, well, let me tell you a little bit about how, how we're doing that at New Relic today. So, we, we made it clear that the plugins have a different look than the standard New Relic. And so if something goes wrong with the page that you know has that look, there's a link on there that says, you know, for support on this page, go here, and it takes you over to the plugin locker. Whereas the normal New Relic pages say, you know, if there's something wrong with this page, go here, and it takes you to, to New Relic support. So we made it very clear to the two different ways. Um, now, as we make the New Relic platform more powerful and integrate it more and more, it's going to be harder and harder to maintain that distinction. Um, because it might be that one chart on the page comes from a plugin, but the other charts come from us. And you know, so then we're going to have to have some other mechanism for routing those things. And at the moment, I don't exactly know what that is other than hiring more support people to send the tickets to someone else. Anyway, thank you very much. Um, we are going to have another Devon Tech Talk on January 28th. We have Ethan Craft coming. He is the best selling author of jQuery in Action and Reels in Action 3. Yeah, Reels 3 in Action. There you go. It's not. Uh... <laughs> anyway, um, how many of you guys use Atlassian products here? Awesome. That's really great to see. And how many of you guys raise your hand work for Atlassian? Okay, so if you have any questions for us, we'd love to talk about what we do. We'd love to talk about working at Atlassian. So come find one of us and uh, and we can chat. I uh, please feel free to get more food, enjoy the beer, enjoy the wine, and thank you so much for coming.